In Long Beach, California, the 2013 Space Tech Expo is open for business. Andrew Nelson is there making his sales pitch for a rocket ship ride into space. So what you're seeing there is you've got two special displays for when you're heading up into space. What do you think? Cool. Very, very good. Cool. Are you ready to go? I am ready to go. Okay, we'll sign you up. Let's do it. You buy 10, I'll give you one for free. All right. Frequent flyer program. <laughs> Although this rocket ship isn't scheduled to take off until late 2014, more than 300 people have already fully paid or made deposits for a $95,000 half hour flight to the edge of space. And Xcor Aerospace, the maker of the Lynx Mark I, is not alone in trying to bring the thrill of space to the public. Well, we already have uh, families who have signed up with us, and they've signed up as charters, you know, so that they're going to take, um, you know, their whole family up into space with us. A rocket-powered family vacation? Space flights for sale? It may seem like science fiction, but it's real, and it's happening now. A new generation of entrepreneurs sprung from the high-risk, high-tech culture of Silicon Valley is launching private, for-profit ventures to open up space for tourism, transportation, rapid earth imaging, and even mining the moon. T-minus one minute, 35 seconds. It's a far cry from the early days of space exploration where the stakes were higher and heroic first steps thrust a nation to exceptional here. heights. The Eagle has landed. In July of 1969, the crew of Apollo 11 achieved President Kennedy's vision of sending American astronauts to the moon by the end of the decade. The Mercury Gemini Apollo program was a creature of the Cold War. We were in a ideological war with the Soviet Union. And when the Soviet Union launched Sputnik, the response by the U.S. was immediate. NASA's budget hit a huge spike. It was almost 5% of the federal budget. Today, the NASA budget is, is less than one half of 1%. Back then, the U.S. government spared no expense to defeat the Soviet Union in the space race. Private companies were essential to this victory, building the vehicles, rocket engines, and electronic systems on early NASA missions. Without the effort of tens, maybe hundreds of thousands of private contractors and for-profit companies, we would not have achieved all these great things. That innovation gave rise to new technologies as computer chips got smaller and more powerful. Many of those chips were made here in Silicon Valley, which today is home to tech giants such as Google and Apple. It's also home to Silicon Valley venture capitalist Steve Jurvetson, who helps fund the game-changing companies of tomorrow. He's also a bit of a space geek, with an impressive collection of space history in his office. In this hall, we have some amazing artifacts, and perhaps the most amazing of all, the actual prototype signed by Buzz Aldrin of the flag. It was a, a last minute thought. Uh, what are we going to put on the moon? Literally months before landing. Pretty amazing to think that engines like this took people to the moon and back safely again. Still flying today. And it was a bunch of companies, U.S. companies, that came up with this technology. As successful as these companies were on early space missions, they had only one main customer, NASA. But now the landscape is changing. Whereas NASA in the past owned and did and paid for everything, now NASA is buying services from the private sector. Much more arm's length relationship. And to me, it represents a transition into what some call new space. In this new age now, in new space, the companies like SpaceX, like Orbital Sciences, are building their own vehicles. And NASA is saying, OK, we'll pay you for the cargo that you bring up and the trash you bring back. We're not going to investigate every nut and bolt. Scott Hubbard worked at NASA for 20 years. Today, he teaches at Stanford University and is the chief editor of New Space, a journal that tracks the impact of the dozens of U.S. companies opening up space to new commercial applications. It's easy to see why they want a piece of the $300 billion global space economy. 
The Gold Rush brought a horde of people from the east out here to try their hand at mining. Most of them were not successful, but grew up around that endeavor was a huge business enterprise. What I think people are looking for today is the Sutter's gold in space. And some of them are seeking their space gold from Silicon Valley startups. So when you combine space, something as exciting and grandiose as space, with the innovation and entrepreneurship of Silicon Valley, anything can happen. <laughs> Bob Richards is the CEO of Moon Express, a company based in Mountain View, California, that is planning an unmanned mission to the moon at a low cost of 50 to 100 million dollars. So in getting to the moon, like any business, it's really about balancing risk and cost. This is a supercomputer in my pocket, a billion times more powerful than what NASA designed to land the first landers on the moon. We can use that technology today, and, and we can use technology largely from the commercial sector. Sure, a privately funded mission to the moon sounds risky, but Richards and his business partner, billionaire tech entrepreneur Navin Jain, think it's a gold mine of a business opportunity. Moon Express is a lunar resources company. That means we will eventually be mining the moon. Asteroids have been bombarding both the Earth and the moon for billions of years, and every asteroid contains billions or maybe even trillions of dollars worth of valuable resources. Platinum group metals or gold or silver. All this stuff came from asteroids. There is even water on the moon, trapped in its soil and craters. Water is made of hydrogen and oxygen, and those are the elements of rocket fuel. And that will completely change the era of space travel, whether it's going to the moon or going to asteroids or going to Mars. But before Moon Express can prospect and mine the moon, it has to get there, which it's trying to do with a lunar lander being tested and developed inside a hangar at the NASA Ames Research Center. Let me show you the test from this morning. This is kind of like driver's ed for the spacecraft. We're teaching it over and over how to land safely. The Moon Express lander is scheduled to launch in 2015 when it will deliver the world's first privately funded lunar telescope. Moon Express is a business, so it's very cool that we actually have paying customers. The International Lunar Observatory Association is paying us to develop and deliver a lunar telescope. So how cool is that? Even more cool would be to beat other private efforts racing to get to the moon by 2015. The Google Lunar X Prize is a $30 million competition funded by Google. The challenge is the first private team to send a robot to the lunar surface to travel 500 meters and to send back high definition video and images from the lunar surface. So that's a big challenge, but Moon Express is one of the top contenders. This first moonshot will be followed by robotic missions to prospect the lunar surface. Not until 2025 or later does the company plan to begin mining for water and metals. But first, can a private company legally extract space resources? The Outer Space Treaty of 1967 is addressed to nations. It says that nations cannot own the moon. It doesn't say anything about whether private companies can settle on the moon or extract the moon's resources. So it's a very open question whether this outer space treaty can now be applied to private companies. Anybody has a right to use the moon uh, as long as you don't claim it for yourself. Um, moon Express is not going to claim anything for itself except the resources that we extract and that's okay. NASA last landed astronauts on the moon more than 40 years ago at a cost of two and a half billion dollars. Today, NASA's entire budget is 18 billion dollars, which isn't likely to grow given huge federal deficits. So NASA is trying to cut costs by paying the private sector for routine missions in low Earth orbit, roughly 100 to 600 miles above Earth. It's a shift which began under President George W. Bush and continued with President Obama. In order to reach the space station, we will work with a growing array of private companies competing to make getting to space easier and more affordable. So when you have competition in this marketplace driving the price down, the government saves a lot of money. So now NASA can push the frontiers of the unknown, explore the planets and the asteroids, all the missions they would want to do, but they don't have to do the plumbing. They don't have to build the rockets. 
In 2006, NASA began a novel program to demonstrate the private sector's ability to deliver and return cargo from low Earth orbit. Although NASA spent nearly a billion dollars on it, private companies such as Orbital Sciences in Virginia and SpaceX in California also had to spend their own money to build spacecraft which they got to keep and operate. For the $800 million that NASA spent under its initial program, we now have two companies, SpaceX and Orbital Sciences, each with their own launch vehicle and their own cargo vehicle. I think that's a real bargain and a, and a tremendous accomplishment. In May 2012, SpaceX became the world's first private company to launch a mission to the International Space Station. NASA awarded it a $1.6 billion contract for 12 missions to deliver cargo, like supplies and experiments, to the space station. I was watching the team here operate in a very high anxiety environment and work through the technical details associated with actually coming that close to a $100 billion crewed orbiting body. And capture is confirmed of this Dragon spacecraft. It was an incredible moment. We really changed the game when it comes to what traditional government contractors are going to be able to do going forward and certainly what they're going to be able to charge for it. NASA is paying SpaceX an average of $133 million for each resupply mission, a fraction of the $500 million or more the agency spent to fly the now-retired space shuttle to the space station. SpaceX may soon be transporting more than just cargo as it competes with two other firms, Boeing and Sierra Nevada Corporation, on a NASA program to build commercial spacecrafts to carry astronauts to orbit. Booster ignition and the final liftoff of Discovery. Since the retirement of the space shuttle fleet in 2012, NASA can't even launch American astronauts to outer space. The Russians are currently charging 70 to 71 million dollars per seat to take U.S. astronauts to the International Space Station. The Russians have turned out to be incredible capitalists, actually. SpaceX says it can do the same job for just 20 million dollars. Still, the space companies of today can't rely on the government to be their only customer, so they have to reach a wider market by trying to make getting into space cheaper. If you were to use a 747 aircraft once, for a trip from LA to New York and not be able to use that aircraft again, you can imagine that that trip to New York City would be incredibly expensive, most likely would never occur. So what we're driving towards is developing and demonstrating the technologies to reuse rockets, bring them back to the launch site, refill them with fuel, put the passengers back on the capsule, and then fly again within a few hours. SpaceX CEO and founder Elon Musk wants to begin flying people to Mars by 2025. Steve Jurvetson, a SpaceX investor and board member, knows the billionaire entrepreneur well. Folks like Elon Musk, the founder of SpaceX, didn't come from an aerospace background. He's a computer scientist by training, and he thinks about the rocket like a computer scientist would. Modular reuse, modern programming languages, everything. Reusable rockets are also being built and tested at another California company, Mastin Space Systems, in the dusty desert town of Mojave, 100 miles north of LA. From this remote location, Mastin seems a world away from the land of driverless cars and dot-com money. But even here, Silicon Valley's influence looms large. There's a bias towards action. If you have a decision between spending a bunch more time doing analysis or getting out there and testing it out, let's go test. Off-the-shelf parts and creative recycling help save valuable production time and money. These are the control buttons that we use to talk to the vehicle in flight. They are mounted not in a fancy steel case, but in the actual box that they were shipped to us in. By saving money, Mastin can focus on pushing its unmanned rockets to one day soar high enough to fly microgravity experiments or do atmospheric research. If you have a payload that you want to launch into space, it can easily take on the order of three years and anywhere from one to five million dollars, if not more. In the future, 
Mastin is going to be able to provide a flight that is $100,000 and brings that payload right back to the launch pad. For now, Mastin's rockets are helping test landing technology being developed by one of its customers, NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. You're gonna put your head down here, you're gonna look up through the chamber and just check for any obvious melting. And you can actually grab the engine, you're gonna move it around and, and feel for, for full motion all the way around. Five, five, two, copy that. Good engine, good shutdown. Pilot, go to post flight. Copy that, good test. It's just another day at the Mojave Air and Spaceport, a former Marine Corps training center. In 2002, when I started here at the airport, uh, Mojave Air and Spaceport had 14 companies and about 400 total people working at the airport. Today, we have 78 companies. We gave people permission to dream, to test, develop, and take enormous risks. One of those companies, XCOR Aerospace, is also in Mojave, building rocket engines and rocket ships for space tourism. One second engine run in three. Two, R. Safe. People don't want to be interested in space as a spectator sport. They want to participate. They're children of the space age. They grew up expecting that we were going to be farther along in space than we are. And now that it looks like it's going to happen, they want to be a part of it. x competition is just around the corner, finishing its test flights to launch passengers 62 miles to the edge of space starting in 2014. 20 or 30 years ago, when I was growing up, you couldn't really expect to go with anybody other than NASA or the Russians. And now, um, you know, there's probably five different companies that aspire to take you into orbit or suborbital. Obviously, we think we're going to be the first. Billionaire British tycoon Richard Branson founded Virgin Galactic in 2005 with the vision of opening up space to the rest of us, that is, those of us who can afford the $250,000 cost of a two and a half hour flight aboard Spaceship Two. But long term, you know, I think the price can come down, and that's exciting to me. I've often thought that there might be sort of a plateau around the, uh, around the SUV price point, you know, where you, know, you get down to that level, it's still expensive, but I think a lot of people would be willing to do this. Before Spaceship Two, there was Spaceship One, the first private piloted craft to fly to space. It was designed by aviation pioneer Burt Rutan, who celebrated Spaceship Two's first supersonic flight in April 2013. <laughs> Milestone. What's really exciting to me is providing high-speed point-to-point -point travel to people, because I think that that's something that we've been waiting for for a really long time. It still takes uh, 12 hours, 16 hours to travel around the globe, when we have technology that could take us there dramatically faster. But rocketing into space is a lot riskier than flying on a commercial airplane. And for now, the regulations are not as stringent. When you get on board an airliner, you can rest assured that the FAA has scrutinized the safety of that airliner. These spacecraft are generally not inspected for safety for the people on board. The FAA does require spacecraft operators to inform interested passengers of any past problems or accidents and that the spacecraft has not been certified by the FAA. Three, two. This is a risky enterprise and like all other forms of transportation before it, it will not probably be devoid of accidents. If we fly in space enough, people will die, just like people die in aircraft accidents, in automobile accidents, and boating accidents. Uh, that's not a pleasant truth, but it is the truth. 
Jimbo. What's up, man? Hey, how's it going? Turkey. Yes. What's up, baby? Big, bold ideas carry risk, but also the chance to do something revolutionary. Being an entrepreneur means fundamentally that you want to change the world. You know, more than creating jobs for people, more than building new technology, more than making money. After meeting as graduate students at Stanford University, Dan Birkenstock and his three friends launched Skybox Imaging in 2009. Although satellite Earth views are available online, the images may be several years old and could use some updating, like the satellites which took them. A typical imaging satellite today uh, costs between half a billion and one billion dollars, with a B. They're about the size of a Suburban, and they take uh, five to eight years, roughly, to build. Many of them are using the same motherboards that were on a desktop computer in 1998. We're trying to build the iPhone of satellites. We take processors off the shelf so that we can fly the latest and greatest components in space that are available in the commercial marketplace. The beauty of this approach is that for less than the cost of a single imaging satellite in today's world, we can launch an entire constellation of satellites. Skybox's smart satellites are being built at the company's headquarters in Mountain View. Although they're small, the size of a dorm room refrigerator, they can capture up-to-date, high-resolution views of the world's streets, waterways, and farmlands. At Skybox, what excites us is really taking that very good foundation of the mapping industry of today and helping to turn that into the monitoring industry of tomorrow where we're not just getting that picture once a year, or once every couple years, we're getting that picture every day, or multiple times per day. Skybox is betting there's a big demand for seeing what's happening in practically any location day to day. No, I think over San Francisco, this would be awesome. You'll be able to see the Bay Bridge, the Golden Gate Bridge, you know, how's your commute to work? All of the shipping traffic yeah. through, throughout the channel and sure. into all the various ports throughout the Bay. I mean, you look at one port in Los Angeles, and there's, there's just so much that you can see changing. I, I can't even imagine what it looks like when we do this on the entire Earth. The first Skybox satellite is scheduled to launch in late 2013. While it's a busy time for the team, they still manage to squeeze in some fun. Yay. Oh, okay. Being an executive of a startup it, is, it's a, it's, a, it's a tough choice to make. I certainly thrive on the excitement of being able to do something new and innovative every day. And uh, the combination of doing that, getting married, having children, you know, all the other things that come with growing up, it's a lot to pack in, but it's a lot of good stuff. If my son came along and wanted to work in the space industry, first of all, I'd probably dissuade him because the space industry is hard. But people that work in space are passionate, and if he was passionate enough, to go out and try and change the game in space, I'd tell them to go to a startup company. Want more science? From jellyfish to climate change, rockets to health. Discover the latest science news, radio and video stories, and resources for educators. And sign up for our weekly e-newsletter. And follow us on Facebook, Google Plus, and Twitter. Find all this and more at kqed.org slash science. Support for KQED Science is provided by the National Science Foundation, the Fallis Family Fund, the Mary Van Voorhees Fund, the S.D. Bechtel Jr. Foundation, the David B. Gold Foundation, the Dirk and Charlene Cabsonell Foundation, 
the Vadez Family Foundation, the Wincoat Foundation, and the Amgen Foundation. Support is also provided by the members of KQED.